Suzy Nobi was born in a small village just outside of Lyon in 1835. She was born into a family where she's the only daughter and the three brothers. And this is post-Revolution France. It's not long afterwards. So that um, there had been a change towards the church in the uh, whole countryside. Her family were Catholic. Her mother, her, her grandmother particularly so. Um, the rest of the family, I think, were came to church for baptism, weddings, funerals, etc. But it was from her grandmother that she learned a deep love of the poor. They would have been middle a middle class family. People came to the the poor came to the door and there was quite a bit of poverty around and she was shown of to take how to take the food to the poor and one day she was criticized by her grandmother because she had not curtsied uh, respectfully enough as she gave the food and she learned from her grandmother that the the privilege of helping the poor and to see that in anyone who particularly who was poor the face of Christ and this became a central point then later when she worked in New Zealand and formed the Sisters of Compassion. So that upbringing, that middle class upbringing that with the huge with the dignity, Christ's dignity of the poor, obviously was a big influence in her life. Yes, it was an immense influence in her life. And another influence that one of her brothers was, um, was born disabled and died young. And again, that had an influence later when she came to New Zealand, or in the later part of her life, uh, when she worked and taught her sisters to work with people so, who were handicapped. So how did her life journey take her from France to, first of all, to Auckland, New Zealand? And she heard Bishop Pompalia speak in Lyon. Lyon at that time, uh, well, actually many founders of religious orders came from Lyon, uh, it, it seemed to be a centre of Catholic life and Bishop Papadia came to Leon several times and spoke and spoke of the Pacific and New Zealand and uh, of the mission there of Māori and Suzanne O'Bear was very interested in what he had to, what he was saying. She wanted to become a religious um, late teens or early twenties and her father would not allow it. She said to him she would stay till she was twenty five. She had heard, she knew that Pompalia was back and um, up in one of the northern ports and round this time the Curie of Ars, who was actually a family friend that um, had died and the family thought that she had gone to his funeral, but she'd actually gone north to get um, catch the boat, a whaling ship coming out to New Zealand. Um, it took, it, it was a huge, a huge rift for her because she loved her family and she loved her father. Um, but in time, he re and by the time he died, he said, you had done the right thing. Um, but it was not easy for her. But she had this strong call to come to the Pacific and to New Zealand. So she set out under the guidance of Bishop Pompey? Yes, he had several um, people with him who were to come to the, the new mission and he taught the Maori on the, I think it was the general test day, the, the boat, the whaling ship coming out. and. So that eventually she became a very fluent Māori speaker and wrote a Māori dictionary and prayer book and um, was able to help many other missionaries coming after her with the language so that French and then Māori, English was her... Th I was, I'm going to say English was her third language but actually she was well educated and had several European languages but for working in New Zealand um, English was her third language. Okay. 
She arrived in Auckland and then I think the journey took her to Hawke's Bay and Wanganui. So could you outline that series? Of yes, she was work well, She came specifically to work amongst the Māori. Yes, the Sisters of the Holy Family. And she and the French-speaking sisters, or French-speaking women who became sisters under the guidance of the Sisters of Mercy, um, started a school for Māori, Māori girls. And they worked there for several years alongside the school and college that the Mercy Sisters were, had been since the 1850s. And Peata, a woman from the north, joined her and was instrumental in helping her to not only understand more about the Māori people but also ta taught her about the herbal remedy. It became very important later when she worked in the Hawke's Bay. When a new bishop, when Bishop Pompalia went back to France and a new bishop came, Bishop Croke, I think it is now, yes, um, they had differences. The, this, well, for one thing, Bishop Pompalia had left a lot of financial difficulties in the diocese, and so he was closing the, Ma the French school, uh, well, no, the, the, the school for Māori run by the French women, uh, and she had no intention of working in the the English school, she had come to work with Māori. And so he, when he closed the order, she said, well, she had no then um, special allegiance in terms of the diocese, she could move. She moved down to the Hawke's Bay as a lay person, particularly working as a district nurse and as a catechist. For the Māori, she had a, had a knowledge of botany Although women could not go to the universities in Europe or anywhere at that time, she had some relation, was involved in medical school, and so behind a, a screen the story goes that she learned chemistry, botany and some of the sciences. And with her knowledge of botany, she, and with the knowledge that Peata had given her in Auckland, she did some experimentation in the Hawke's Bay and when the Māori saw that she was using this for healing they gradually learned to trust her trust her with some of their knowledge. This knowledge had became very important because later on she used this in the Wanganui River as well and or then later on she with the herbal remedies um, the sisters helped her in the, the um, Wanganui River, but she didn't ever share the actual basic recipe. Later she sold the, this to Kempthorne and Prosses, who were then going to commercialise it, but she then found that they were diluting the, the mixture, and that was the end of that. However, in recent times we have formed a contract with the Crown Research um, Group, and the the local iwi in the Wanganui River and in the Hawke's Bay, so that we have a, an understanding in case people now who are often wanting to research these remedies, um, it has to be with the agreement of the three parties. So that protects the intellectual property of the, the iwi people. So that whole phase of her life, which is fairly well known, the, yes. the remedies and that, in fact, is continuing on today in that form? Yes, it's, it's continuing on now in the interest in what formed them, how she received them, and the, we're very happy with this contract that we have because it protects everybody's interests while leaving it open for future research. So what we're saying is we're likely to see painted in medicines that originated out of uh, Susan Orbeer? We may. It's hard to know exactly how it would move, mm -hmm. but um, the, the many of the descendants of the people who entrusted her with the, um, the knowledge uh, are becoming increasingly interested themselves, and so it's important that we work together ethically. Could you enlighten us about the Wellington and uh, for subsequent uh, eras of her life and what, what occurred in Wellington? Yes, while she was working in the Hawke's Bay, um, a Maori from the Wanganui River was trading sheep over in the, the Hawke's Bay and 
want, and around this time, uh, another a, a French priest, French Maoist, had come out to Hawke's Bay. And this Maori, Taifoti, saw the effect of um, not only Father Sulis working there in the Hawke's Bay, but also Suzanne Obeer. And he was later in communication with Archbishop Redwood and requested a priest for the Whanganui River to come. Now, prior to this, there had been a Māori mission on the Whanganui River, but that came to an end following the Battle of Motua in the 1860s. And then there was a, a, a school was needed at Haraharama, and there had been varying people running the school, but it didn't last for very long, and so the idea was that, it would be, that a school would be run by the new mission. And the Sisters of St. Joseph were to staff the school, and Suzanne was to come and help them with, um, with the whole Māori language. It was for varying reasons. Um, this, the sister stayed for a year and moved from Jerusalem, later from her home. Um, Jerusalem is the European name. And the sta Suzanne Obia took over the school and went to Wanganui and asked, she was in the presbytery there, and uh, there were several young women from local families, and said, who's going to come and join me? And what we call the ABC of the order, the three women that became Sister Anne, Bridget and Carmel, joined her over that next period. And they not only ran the school, but developed the herbal remedies and did more and more sick visiting in the area, often on horseback. Because, because of course at that stage the road was the river, so that access around was either by canoe or horseback or walking. And um, it was from there that our order started. She always saw Archbishop Redwood as the founder. We didn't. We have always seen Suzanne over as a But however, he was a very good friend to her. And I think it would, well, he was really the instrument of God in, in leading her to start the, con the congregation. So that's the roots of the order being founded. Yes. And then there was a journey from there to Wellington. To Wellington and then to Rome. Yes, well, the, the Wellington, what happened. To, also at Jerusalem, I keep calling it Jerusalem, or well now more and more we're calling it Haraharama, is that people in Whanganui were sending small children and babies on the paddle steamer up to um, Haraharama for Suzanne Over and the sisters to look after. It's hard for us to realise nowadays, but the, the way that single women who had and children out of wedlock were, were viewed by society and sometimes a woman in desperation would put a baby in a cradle with a, a, a tag for Susan or for Mother Rabia and this would go on the paddle steamer. She also had, uh, there were other families possibly very poor unable to look after several children and would send one to her to look after her so almost despite herself she formed a, an orphanage and some of these children often came and went, were unwell and she realised that she was going to have to be closer to good medical care if the children were to be looked after properly and that really was what started her, her work, her coming to Wellington in the, at the end of the century in 1899 to come to Wellington um, to get better care for the children. She, uh, the first work in Wellington, well, they came, the sisters, she and a couple of sisters came at the end of the century. Uh, they were made to feel very at home by the parishioners and the priest at St. Joseph's Parish, which is now Mount Victoria. The church was then centred in Buckle Street. And so they settled in a cottage in that area and found the need for district nursing. And eventually she um, built a place there in Buckle Street where they looked after the chronic elderly people who are chronically ill. 
Then saw the need for soup kitchen, and interestingly enough, it was for working men having difficulty holding down a job because they were so hungry by the time the wife and the children were fed. Wages were poor, and of course there were no family benefits and things like that. So the soup kitchen has had quite a, a journey over the years because it's now been in existence 103 years this year. And uh, it's moved from for working men people that know as the old Alkies to a range of need today. But unfortunately it was as much need today in 2004 as it was 100 years ago. Other all bear went to Rome and got uh, an approval for her family. Her yes, uh, partly that she wanted to put the order in a, on a firm foundation. To do so, you had to be in two dioceses. So over the years, she had founded um, a community in Auckland. So we were in Auckland and Wellington. But she also wanted the the approval of the Pope for the work with children. It was not exactly. Fa uh, viewed with great favour for religious women to be looking after children who were illegitimate. Um, and that didn't worry Suzanne Hobie one bit. These were children in need and their parents were in need. She was very careful over that period to protect the reputation of the, the mother and quite understood that um, if the father was known that all that information was kept very private to the extent that it often was difficult for her to get funding from social welfare because they needed to know all the detail. She felt it was more important that the woman had um, a, a better opportunity then to get, um, to get good work and be able to make an a, a honourable marriage in society as it was seen. So that um, consequently she felt it was important to fight for the children. And so at 78, fleeing the country, not even telling the sisters she was going, because she felt that they might try and stop her, um, goes to Rome, sees the Pope, but is caught by an earthquake where she helps nurse earthquake victims, and then there's the outbreak of World War I, uh, in which case she helps there. Um, knows of some of her earlier... Um, children that she looked after were now soldiers in the war and she kept contact with some of those. Um, but it was a great difficulty then getting back to New Zealand because by 1919-1920 the war is over but she had never taken out, well in those days I don't think you had a passport, she was so f away from France for so long and now she had never been a declared a New Zealand citizen. So the sisters intervened with Sir Joseph Ward who sent over someone to bring her back was at that this stage well on in her eighties. So from there, obviously back here and the work very much established. Yes, at Island Bay the um, children were in the home at Island Bay but she wanted then a hospital which would be in the same building but she wanted a, play, a hospital where her sisters could train so that they would be able to be more effective in nursing the elderly and the children. And um, so that took quite a lot of effort. And she built up a good rapport with many doctors on the Wellington scene. But we have wonderful stories of links she has with women down there. And there are a lot of the many, the 
unsung stories or stories of unsung heroes of pioneer women, so many Catholic women, West Coast, and then we had so many vacations from there. In 1926 she died. She was 91. Um, the sisters had known for some time she was failing. And although she was such a, a person who was so... Over the years she'd become a woman of deep prayer. She was not only... Um, no, and a, and a, a, a very early ecumenist. She knew so many of her friends were across the different churches. So when she died she was very well known in so many circles that the judges, she had a very good friend um, who had been in Chapman Trip and had helped her form a, a trust for the order, became um, a, a judge in the High Court and he closed the, the courts, many shops closed. It was the biggest funeral there ever been for a woman and probably the biggest funeral ever since for a woman. Photographs show the, the crowds at her funeral. upon her. They dimmed the light of her eyes. They bent the grace of her body. She sleeps, but soon will rise. We realised in the nine, late 1980s that we should do something about the cause of Suzanne Aubier, but realised we needed to have an authentic biography. That led to, um, and there again, somebody we appointed was moved and someone else we appointed died, but we were led, and I'm sure it was Divine Providence that led to Jesse Munro writing the book. It's, it's a wonderful story, the way that she sets the whole story of Suzanne Ober against the social history of the time. It's, um, it's not a pious account, it's, it's a, a story of a living, feisty, determined, holy woman. And we've learnt so much more about her.
Seems as though we have about three miracles. These have been um, investigated during the process, the recent process of looking at the cause in terms of what we call the diocesan process, where her writings are looked at in great detail, both from the point of view of history and theology. And in fact, everything that she has written has been investigated carefully by experts in the field. And several sisters whose families knew her, and sisters, unfortunately we have no sisters alive that, well, it's, quite, it's a good while since, but because the process has been delayed, there are no sisters alive who knew her. But stories have been passed down. For instance, the novice mistress that I learnt from in my early days knew Suzanne Abea. She knew her when she was quite old, so that the Suzanne Obia I think that she knew would have been very different from stories that people would have said of the Suzanne Obia in Auckland or Hawke's Bay or even in Jerusalem. Of a, a small but determined woman who used to come and give them, while she was well, she would come and give them talks every day. And she said certainly one of the, the impressions was how she saw Christ in every person, and particularly in Please no. 